Hello everyone, my name is Jordan. In today's presentation, I will be joined by fellow speakers Nelson, Ruby, Brad and Sammy. Together we will summarise prostate cancer in its usual presentation, as well as the normal imaging pathways for the disease, nuclear medicine's interaction with prostate cancer, and other available therapies for treatment. So, what is the prostate? The prostate is a small male accessory sex gland that's main role is to secrete prostatic fluid. It is located at the bladder outlet and encircles the urethra. The tissues of the gland can be divided into three main zones. From innermost to outermost, they include the transitional zone, the smallest portion and most likely to form benign prostatic hyperplasia, the central zone, making up 25% of the prostate and houses ductus ejaculatorius, and the peripheral zone, the most common site for malignant tumours. Prostate cancer occurs when abnormal cells develop within the prostate gland. The mechanisms for how this can occur is unknown. However, most prostatic cancers are adenocarcinomas as they arise from cells that line the prostate gland itself. There are other types of cells within the prostate which can cause prostate cancers called sarcoma, small cell carcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors, and transitional cell carcinomas. However, these are all extremely rare in comparison. The prognosis of prostate cancer is directly correlated with the staging of the disease. In some cases, the cancer may be slow growing and contained within the prostate gland itself, which is known as localized or early prostate cancer. In other cases, the cancer grows more rapidly and can spread to other sites of the body, commonly bone, nearby lymph nodes, lungs, liver, and rarely brain. This is called advanced or metastatic prostate cancer. Australia uses the Gleason score to grade prostate cancer or determine the risk of spread or growth. It compares the cancerous cells to healthy tissue to highlight how abnormal the cancerous tissue is. A higher score is associated with an increased risk and more abnormal tissue. The most common staging method used is TNM staging, which stands for tumor, nodes, and metastases. This method uses diagnostic tools such as digital rectum examinations, MRI, CT, and nuclear medicine scans to detect cancerous tissue. This system determines the extent of cancerous growth within the prostate as well as spread to proximal nodes and other regions of the body. Symptoms of prostate cancer will vary depending on the staging of the disease. For example, larger tumors may alter normal anatomy such as impingement on the urethra which can cause difficulty urinating. Other symptoms can include pain during urination, blood in the urine or semen, pain in the pelvis or back or chest, weakness or numbness in the legs and feet, tiredness, shortness of breath, nausea, tachycardia, pale skin, bone pain, and non-traumatic related fractures. While there is no known etiology of the disease, some risk factors include non-modifiable factors such as age and a family history of prostate cancer. Mutations of the BRCA1 and 2 genes and Lynch syndrome also increase the risk of developing prostate cancer. Being overweight and a history of low fertility levels are also recognized as risk factors. While the majority of these are non-modifiable, maintaining a healthy lifestyle and diet can help to avoid some of these risks. Prostate cancer was the most commonly diagnosed cancer among men in Australia in 2015, estimated to account for approximately 25% of new male cancer cases in 2019. If it's detected early, it may have a very good prognosis that is only improving with new treatments being developed, boasting a 95% five-year survival rate in patients between 2011 to 2015. However, the rate of survival may drop to as low as 32% if distant metastases are found. It is expected that in 2019, there will be 19,500 new cases of prostate cancer, and 3,306 deaths due to prostate cancer in Australia. Prostate cancer also has a substantial impact on a global scale. It is the fifth leading cause of death worldwide with approximately 1,276,106 new cases reported in 2018. In terms of incidence and prevalence, there is a greater prevalence of disease in developed countries. This may be due to greater access to healthcare systems, leading to successful diagnoses such as PSA testing. African American men have higher incidence rates and more aggressive types of prostate cancer compared to white men. The age standardized incidence rates were highest in Oceania, being 71.9 per 100,000 people, and Australia held the second highest mortality rate, being 10.2 per 100,000 people. 
Currently, age is thought to be the most influential factor of likeliness of developing prostate cancer, with an associated incidence rate of 60% in men over 65. Studies have also shown that almost 30% of men who die over the age of 50 for causes other than prostate cancer have shown histological evidence of the disease at autopsy. The imaging pathway chosen plays a vital role in diagnosing, treating and managing prostate cancer. The decision for imaging is guided for the intention to treat and the patient risk stratification. The key approaches involve diagnostic accuracy, accurate surveillance and monitoring reoccurrence, and staging and assessing the response to treatment. MRI's primary role is staging local tumours and assessing the prostate size. Multiplanar imaging MRIs provide higher accuracy in staging local disease than transrectal ultrasound. Currently, the Western Australian Government recommends performing an MRI before a trust-guided biopsy. This was supported when a study demonstrated that 51% of cases may not require a biopsy if MRI demonstrates no evidence of a tumour. Each lesion is assigned a score on the PIRAD system for clinical significance. A PIRAD 1 is considered very low, whereas a PIRAD 5 is considered very high for clinical significance. The T1 weighted images are used to demonstrate pelvic nodes, bone metastases and hemorrhaging of the prostate gland. The T2 weighted images represent the zonal anatomy. Performing a T1 and T2 with the same axial slice thickness can help distinguish between the tumour and hemorrhaging more effectively. Figure 1 shows normal prostate anatomy. The peripheral and central zones are not distinguishable on the T1 weighted image, but is seen on the T2 weighted image. The neurovascular bundles are better represented on the T1 weighted images and can be seen at 7 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Figure 2 shows focal prostate cancer compared on T1 and T2 weighted images. Transrectal ultrasound is a non-ionizing imaging procedure which uses a high frequency transducer to precisely indicate zonal anatomy. The appearance of tumours using truss varies from hypoechoic, isoechoic and hyperechoic. Truss is commonly performed after an MRI or if an MRI in core biopsy was not performed. During a transrectal ultrasound, a systematic guided biopsy is performed to increase sensitivity. A standard of 10 to 12 cores are extracted and examined for cancerous cells. A transperineal is when a biopsy is inserted into the perineum below the testes, and a transrectal is when the biopsy is inserted through the rectum wall. Computed tomography is primarily used for metastatic staging of lymph node involvement. It demonstrates high specificity at detecting and differentiating met metastatic spread in the lymph nodes. Figure 3 demonstrates a representation of lymph node involvement seen on a CT. Although highly specific, CT is highly dependent on the size criteria of the lymph nodes, which results in low sensitivity. Further imaging using hybrid imaging, such as PET slash CT, greatly increases the sensitivity and specificity at investigating lymph node involvement. A variety of nuclear medicine procedures exist when imaging prostate cancer, including 99M technetium bone scans for bony metastatic spread and a number of PET traces for looking at the primary tumour as well as metastatic spread throughout the body. The current procedure of choice for patients with prostate cancer at any stage of the disease is gallium-68 PSMA. This radiopharmaceutical is comprised of gallium-68, a positron-emitting radioisotope with a half-life of approximately 68 minutes that is produced from the parent isotope 68 germanium in a generator. The maximum energy photon emitted is 1.92 megaelectron volts and the average 0.89 megaelectron volts. The gallium is then labelled to the glycoprotein prostate-specific membrane antigen. This protein is found on the surface integral membrane of numerous cells, specifically prostate cells, but is overexpressed significantly in prostate cancer cells. Once intravenously injected, the tracer undergoes constitutive internalization into cells and is expressed on the membrane. 
Images are able to identify the primary tumour as well as lymph node, soft tissue and bone metastases due to the increased expression of this biomarker. These images have proven to be very sensitive even in patients with low PSA levels and can be used as a tool in staging as well as throughout and post-treatment. Patient dose is approximately 1.8 to 2.2 megabecquerels of activity per kilogram of body weight. There is no preparation prior to the injection other than keeping hydrated, but afterwards there is a one hour uptake period and the bladder should be emptied prior to imaging to remove activity accumulated in overlying structures. An image is taken typically from vertex to mid thighs and is fused with a CT taken at the end of acquisition. Gallium PSMA is the ideal imaging procedure due to its proven abilities over other traces. Its ability to detect lymph node and soft tissue metastases makes it superior in evaluating spread over bone scans and 18F sodium fluoride scans. Gallium PSMA also has a high detection rate when compared to 18F leukoclavine scans. There is also higher specificity than 18F FDG due to FDG being extremely sensitive to a number of pathologies. FDG also has more risk of a scan being compromised due to the strict patient preparation. Another pet tracer is carbon-11 choline, which has a half-life of only 20 minutes, which makes it an unviable option in most departments. This image shows the increased sensitivity of gallium-68 PSMA compared to a 99M technetium MDP bone scan for detection of bony metastases, as well as being able to identify lymph node metastases and a deposit within the left infraspinatus muscle. These images show the ability to track progress of chemotherapy treatment using standard uptake values. On the left is showing pre-chemotherapy treatment with the SUV max 35.6 within the lumbar spine and on the right is after three cycles of chemotherapy and the SUV maxed in the lumbar spine has decreased to 15.8. Okay, so moving on to the role nuclear medicine plays in prostate cancer therapy. First of all, a little overview of the current treatment pathway and options for prostate cancer, starting with PSA marker surveillance, and then of course prostatectomy, radiation therapy, chirosurgery, which is shown on the right of the slide, castration, chemo, immunotherapy, and finally theranostics, of which we'll be focusing on 177 lutetium and 225 AC PSMA therapy. 177 lutetium PSMA therapy is currently in the process of clinical trial in Australia and has shown extremely promising results for patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So typically patients that we see for this therapy will have had their prostate removed, they've been through radiation, chemo and despite castration their PSA levels are rising and they've had no response to therapy. This is seen as a palliative stage treatment option. So a few basic characteristics of lutetium-177. It is a synthetic beta-emitting radioisotope with a half-life of roughly 7 days and maximum tissue penetration of 1.5 millimetres. Patient viability criteria of this trial therapy must show high PSMA avividity on 68 gallium PSMA PET-CT without discordant disease on FDG PET-CT. A review of the literature suggests up to 20% of men with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer will not be eligible for lutetium PSMA therapy due to inadequate expression of PSMA. So this patient here would not be eligible for this therapy as he has a negative gallium scan and positive FDG scan. Additional pre-workup tests do vary from each institution. Patients may undergo MAG3 scans or GFR estimations and salivary scans, obviously due to the physiological expression of the tracer. Then based on visual estimation of the disease, these pre-workup tests and weight, the patient may be administered 3 to 8 gigs from anywhere between 3 to 6 cycles. It is important to note 
The variant PSMA used for therapy is not the same variant used for diagnostic imaging, which is PSMA 11. PSMA 617 is used due to its altered chemical structure, which makes labelling to theranostic agents possible. It does exhibit the exact same properties as PSMA 11. Pictured here is an almost fully automated lab setup. It's fairly basic and synthesis time is roughly 30 minutes. These images are of a patient involved in the Peter Mac therapy trial undertaken at the Marta Calvary Hospital, Newcastle. Before this patient's first cycle, he complained of significant bone pain and after the first treatment, he had issues with prolonged nausea. Upon return for his third cycle, the patient did not report any significant problems. Imaging usually commences 24 hours after administration. Medium energy coordinators are used with a photo peak of 208 keV. Retention data is obtained with regions of interest around the whole body, reference activity and background, which gives a retention value when formulated with the injected activity and other contributing factors. This patient's third cycle had a retention value of 18.7. So, in terms of radiation safety, as with anything, we want to follow the principles of time distance shielding to minimise both beta and gamma exposure. You'll only need to be around the patient when the dose is administered. The tracer goes through rapid renal excretion, so keeping in mind these patients are usually incontinent, and as part of the prep they will be drinking huge volumes of water and visiting the toilet frequently. So it's ideal to put the patient in the uptake room closest to the toilet. If the department has pet uptake rooms, the shielding in these will be more than adequate at reducing dose rates as lutetium-177 has lower gamma emissions than F18. Patients can be discharged after about 4 hours. And finally, should this therapy still be considered a palliative treatment? Here's an example of an exceptional tumour response, with the last cycle showing no visual evidence of disease. Other future applications for this treatment include tagging PSMA onto alpha emitters. 225 actinium is also under clinical trial. Actinium-225 PSMA radiotherapy is an emerging treatment option for nuclear medicine therapy in patients with advanced or late-stage prostate cancer. The modality involves targeted alpha particle therapy, or TAP for short, in order to deliver radiation dose more effectively and efficiently, high emission energy of 6 mega electron volts, and an ideal half-life of 10 days make the isotope ideal for therapeutic purposes. In addition to this, the weighting factor of alpha particles in tissue is approximately 20 times higher than that of beta particles due to the mass of alpha particles, as well as the range being only 50 micrometers. These properties combined means actinium can be bound to PSMA 617 and used to maximize cytotoxic effects to cancer cells while simultaneously minimizing the effective dose to surrounding healthy tissue. With regards to dosing, there is currently no standard metric to calculate dose. However, clinical trials have shown positive results with 100 kilobecquerels per kilogram of body weight. Actinium-225 is produced from its parent isotope, radium-225, which is acquired from thallium-229, a byproduct of uranium-233 nuclear waste. If the use of actinium becomes popular worldwide, this may reduce the need for nuclear waste storage. Whilst clinical trials have shown promising results for actinium PSMA therapy, more research needs to be done to prove it is a consistently reliable form of treatment. For example, reduction of cytotoxic effects to lacrimal glands to reduce the prevalence of xerostomia in patients. In case 1, we see a gallium PSMA PET scan of a patient with metastatic prostate cancer and a PSA of 2,923. After three cycles of actinium PSMA therapy, PSA had reduced from to 0 0.26 and visible metastatic involvement had all but vanished. One last cycle was performed and PSA was lessened to below measurable levels. This stark difference between image A and image C occurred between just 9 months and 4 total cycles of actinium PSMA therapy. Case 2 shows in a patient with advanced abdominal metastases for prostate cancer. After two cycles of lutetium PSMA therapy, patient's PSA had further increased and visible tumour progression was noted on the gallium PSMA scan. At this point, therapy was changed to actinium PSMA and after only two cycles, PSA was reduced to 3.5 and visible metastases had decreased significantly. After a third cycle, patient was in complete remission. This case reinforces the promise of actinium PSMA therapy as a treatment option for advanced stage prostate cancer.